It is my pleasure and honor to introduce my very good friend, Sue Yanoff, to all of the people who are on. Sue is a veterinarian who is mostly retired. She has, she is a special interest in sports medicine and she does teach for Frenzy Dog Sports Academy. She teaches a course on um, performance. Um, canine sports medicine. Canine sports medicine. She has two beagles. Ivy and Quinn, who she is training in tracking, obedience, agility, and she does confirmation with them too. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm Nancy Ullman. I'm the unofficial program director for Great Barrington Kennel Club. So I'm going to turn it over to Sue and let her share her expertise. Okay, thanks, Nancy. So I'm going to talk about old dogs. And, and um, I was asked to talk about this for my uh, dog training club in Ithaca, New York. And I basically, in no particular order, just put some things down that might help you when you have to deal with your old dogs. And if we all have dogs, we're all gonna have old dogs. So we have to deal with it. So the first, and I think, did you all get the handout? I think I sent a handout. That was anyway, posted if, to the GBKC website. Uh, Facebook page. Okay, so it's somewhere. Um, the first thing that I have jotted down is old age is not a disease. And I don't like it when owners and or veterinarians blame something on old age. So if your dog is like, say, limping, um, I don't want somebody to tell you, well, she's getting old. That's not the cause of the limping. Why is she limping? Um, does she have arthritis? Did she tear a cruciate ligament? Did she hurt something else? So dogs don't limp just because they're old, but old dogs can have arthritis and can have other injuries that cause them to limp. So it's not due to old age. Or say your dog's activity is decreasing. They're not as active as they used to be. I don't wanna hear for the first time that, well, she's getting old. Again, old age is not a disease. Why are they slowing down? Do they have pain? Um, do they have a heart problem that's making it harder for them to get oxygen and therefore they can't be as active? So things like that, I want you to think about if your dog is having a problem and somebody says, well, they're getting old, that's not necessarily the reason and I want you to pursue it further. Along the same lines kind of is, I have a number for number two, I, I wrote down pain and control of pain. And I think pain in animals uh, probably all animals, but specifically dogs, is undertreated because we don't necessarily recognize it. And I, I've done webinars just on pain and can go through a whole bunch of, of signs and symptoms of pain, which can include slowing down or not being as active. Uh, a lot of things that you would blame on old age but that is something, one of probably one of the first things you should investigate if you have an old dog that's slowing down, you know, a little bit stiff getting up, uh, kind of ate what we say in veterinary medicine, ADR, ain't doing right. Um, we need to consider pain. And sometimes it takes a little bit of investigating to try to find the source of the pain. But if you can find the source of the pain, and it needs to be treated. And then it's not unreasonable to treat a dog with some pain meds to see if that improves their symptoms or their signs. Uh, things in older dogs that can cause pain, as I've mentioned before, arthritis. Uh, arthritis or degenerative joint disease is very common in older dogs. I mean, it's common in older people too. And anybody who likes cats, it's much, much underdiagnosed in cats. A lot of older cats have arthritis and we don't recognize it because it's even harder to um, evaluate pain in cats than it is in dogs. Um, a lot of dogs, again, depending on the breed, but all dogs can have back pain because of arthritis in the back or degenerative disc disease. So that's something to consider. And then dental problems, uh, tooth pain can be an issue, which again, you might not even notice it. And it might not be that the dog's not eating well, but the, um, kind of the chronic pain, pain that's always there can change your dog's behavior. So, so, and there's lots of other things that can cause pain, but that's what I want you to think of with older dogs that are doing things that make somebody says, well, they're getting old. Uh, the third thing I have on the handout is that it's important for you to maintain a healthy weight. And I think uh, you'd probably agree that a lot of dogs are overweight 
in veterinary practice when I was doing private practice more regularly, it was a very common problem for dogs to be overweight, if not downright obese. And, you know, a lot of people equate food with love and they look at you with those eyes and they look so sad and they want treats and um, they don't always get healthy treats. And I, I mean, um, I give my dogs people food and um, I have no problem with that. It doesn't make them sick. It makes some dogs sick, but I have beagles and they have iron stomachs. Nothing makes them sick. Um, but you don't have to give your dogs people food, but a lot of people do give their dogs treats and other high, high calorie treats uh, and foods and may not give them a really good diet or basically just feed them too much of their regular diet. So I think a lot of dogs are, are overweight. And when you have little dogs, I mean, if your dog gains half a pound, that could be 10% of their body weight. So you have to be really careful with little dogs. With older dogs, again, being overweight is a really common problem, but with uh, older dogs, especially when they get into their teens, they can be underweight and it's sometimes hard to keep weight on them. And I've had old dogs where I've had to really increase how much I'm feeding them uh, when, you know, all my, all their lives, I'm so careful about how much they get and, and how many treats they get. And if they're getting this many treats and they get less at meal times. Um, but I have had older dogs where I've actually had to increase their food as they get older, sometimes to the point where you have to add high calorie foods like canned food or other things to get them to maintain their body weight. And there's something called sarcopenia, which just means uh, decreased muscle, decreased amount of muscle. Again, this is common in older animals of any breed or any species, and it's also common in older people, elderly people they lose muscle mass. And, and so it's important for them to exercise just like it's important for older dogs to exercise. But maintaining a healthy weight is very important for any animal of any age, but especially as they get older. There is something um, called canine cognitive dysfunction syndrome. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's similar to Alzheimer's disease in people. Um, and some people refer to it as senility. Uh, and this is also fairly common. I, um, I went to a lecture uh, um, on canine cognitive dysfunction last year. Well, I didn't go to the lecture. It was, it was by Zoom as everything is these days. And the prevalence of canine cognitive dysfunction in dogs uh, at 10 to 12 years of age is about 5%. And in dogs 14 years of age or more is 41%. Uh, I can't remember who was giving the talk or, or where these numbers came from, but it seems to me it's, I mean, I would have guessed more than 5% of dogs have some form of canine cognitive dysfunction. And basically the clinical signs can be things like confusion um, or you know, not really sure where they are sometimes, um, forgetting their training or, or not being able to respond to cues that, you, that they've responded to all their lives. Um, sorry, one dog finished to chewy and the other dog is still doing it. And so the first dog came to me for more, but she's, she's done. She's not getting any more. It's Quinn who's still chewing, Mary. <laughs> Ivy finished it quickly. Okay, sorry, I digress. Okay, clinical signs of canine cognitive dysfunction, confusion, as I said, anxiety. A lot of dogs, uh, older dogs can get anxious. And sometimes it's because they might be losing their sight or they might be losing their hearing, but it can also be to this neurological dysfunction called canine cognitive dysfunction. Sleep disturbances are also common. So, you know, if you've ever had an older dog that stays up at night or can't fall asleep or whines at night or wanders around the house, that can be a sign of cognitive dysfunction, as can restlessness. Uh, sometimes decrease interactions with the owner. So a dog that's always been cuddly and wants to sit next to you and, and be with you can seem aloof and not want to do things with you. So any, again, these are all clinical signs that you might not consider abnormal in an older dog. And, and again, getting back to what we talked about in the beginning, you might just say, well, she's getting old, but it's not as I said, old age is not a disease, and this is a syndrome that we recognize and we can treat. We can't cure it, but we might be able to alleviate some of the symptoms and slow the progression. It's just like with Alzheimer's can't be cured. 
uh, but you can take steps to ameliorate the symptoms or maybe slow the progression. And in the handout, I listed some things. There are some diets, uh, specifically Purina has a, a food called Bright Minds. They also have a Purina Pro Plan NeuroCare and Hills makes a diet called BD, which stands for Brain Diet. And all these diets have ingredients that can improve the symptoms of cognitive dysfunction and slow the progression. There are drugs that can be used, specifically something called selegiline or anapril. Uh, and there are supplements that can be given that will help alleviate the signs or slow the progression. So if your dog is showing any signs of cognitive disorder uh, or just are not right, this is something you should talk to your vet about. And I would think that most veterinarians would know about this, but they might not necessarily think about it. So if you know that it exists, you can specifically say to your veterinarian, you know, I've read about this thing called canine cognitive dysfunction. Do you think that could be part of the problem and what can we do to treat it? So there's lots of lots on the uh, internet. If you want to uh, Google it, you'll find lots of information, some of it correct, some of it not correct, but now at least you've heard about it. So you're a little bit more educated. And I mentioned with canine cognitive dysfunction that some dogs can have anxiety because they might be losing their hearing or losing their sight. And hearing loss is pretty common in older dogs. And if you, you know, dogs are so good at adapting that you might not notice that they are losing their hearing. Uh, they might not respond to cues, but you have to be careful because uh, some dogs might have selective hearing. And my older beagle is almost nine. And sometimes I think, man, I think she's getting hard of hearing. But then she could be fast asleep upstairs and I very, very quietly remove the cover to the cookie jar to give a treat to the other dog and the older dog comes running down the stairs. So I know that she's obviously not leaving her hearing yet. But that is something that's pretty common in dogs. And if you're not looking for it, uh, they can compensate very easily. They can also surprisingly compensate pretty easily for losing their sight. And in vet school, our ophthalmologists used to tell us that blindness in people is a tragedy. Blindness in dogs is an inconvenience. So dogs don't sit there feeling sorry for themselves. They just adapt. And if you don't move the furniture in your house or don't take them places that they're not familiar with, you would be surprised or maybe not um, how well the dogs can get along even as they lose their sight. Uh, there are some things that can cause older dogs to lose their sight that can be treated like cataracts. Uh, the, the cataract surgery in dogs is pretty common and that can restore their sight. They can also have retinal degeneration, which cannot be treated and cannot be cured. So there's a couple of different things that can cause blindness. Uh, it's losing their sight gradually is not as common as losing their hearing gradually, but those are two things that are pretty common in older dogs that may or may not be a problem for them. Uh, the next thing I have on my list and if anybody has any questions, it's fine with me if you want to interrupt while I'm talking. I'll, I'll stay here as long as you want to answer your questions when I'm done. But if you think of something and you want to uh, bring it up while I'm talking, uh, that's fine with me. Um, so the next thing I have on my list is dental disease. And this is also very common in older dogs. Uh, it's actually common in younger dogs also. And the important thing, or one of the important things to know about dental disease is what you see isn't always what you get. Uh, and I learned this the hard way with the previous Beagle uh, before Ivy. Um, and her teeth, I mean, I brushed my dog's teeth and her teeth didn't look that bad, but she had an odor in her mouth that got worse and worse over several months. Um, I finally took her to a, a dog dentist and, and there are veterinarians that specialize in dentistry. Uh, and she had a lot of dental disease that was mostly on the inside. So when you lift your dog's lip and look at the teeth, they can look pretty good there. But what's happening on the inside of the mouth and also what's happening below the gum line uh, can be pretty severe. Uh, so 
I don't know how many of you brush your dog's teeth. Some dogs get really, really bad dental disease. Usually smaller dogs are worse than bigger dogs. Some dogs it might not look that bad. Uh, I, am, I do not tend to bring my dogs in for uh, a dental exam if I don't notice a problem. Um, but I am a lot quicker to bring them in for a dental exam uh, if I notice an odor that's just not getting better with brushing or if I notice any uh, redness around the gums. Oh, there is a beagle. <laughs> uh, is that beagle paying attention, Mary? Doesn't look like it. Oh, hi, Sue. You're there too? Hi, Sue. All right, sorry. Um, I digress again. So anyway, the point of dental disease is sometimes it's really obvious and sometimes it's not so obvious. And if your dog, if you notice your dog seems a little uncomfortable eating, if you notice, and again, sometimes signs of dental pain could be not even related to the mouth. You all have probably seen what tartar looks like or calculus and you've probably seen some redness along the line. The important thing to remember about dental disease is it can be a lot worse than it looks on the outside. So uh, a lot of general practitioners are pretty good about um, cleaning your dog's teeth. Uh, some of them take x-rays and some of them don't. Uh, I, I don't I don't like to spend thousands of dollars on my dog's teeth. Ivy had some dental work um, before I left New York to come down here to North Carolina and the cost was around $3,000 because she had um, a full exam. She had uh, x-rays of her whole mouth, which is really the only way to tell if the roots are healthy. And she had, I think, three or four teeth pulled for various reasons. Uh, there is a board certified veterinary dentist um, about an hour from where Nancy and I live, Dr. Davis. We also have Cornell University near us, but that can be a hassle sometimes to deal with. So uh, it, yeah, it's a lot of money uh, and it's, it's hard to say, yes, go ahead and pull the teeth when the, the teeth seem fine on the outside. But I also know that just because they are fine on the outside doesn't mean that they are fine. And as long as she's under anesthesia, those teeth that he pulled may not have looked that bad now, but they would have gotten worse and she would have had to just have another um, procedure, general anesthesia to, to pull the tooth eventually. So, you know, I trust this, uh, this veterinarian to know what he's doing. He's a specialist and that's what I pay him for. So of course it's not gonna be that as a, as a that, a, it's not going to be as expensive to have dental work done in a general practitioner, but you also might not get as thorough a job. So it's just something to keep in mind. I just want you to know that with dental disease, as I said, it's like an iceberg. What you see doesn't really tell you the whole story. And there are uh, veterinary dental specialists if you think your dog needs more than what a general practitioner can do. Nancy, I think you've taken your dogs to Dr. Davis, right? Yeah, I have. That's so, okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, the other thing I want you to know is there's something called the Veterinary Oral Health Council and uh, VOHC. I, I put a, um, uh, a website URL in the handout Basically, what they do is, well, they do a lot of things. They give, there's a lot of good information if you get on their website about uh, dental disease in dogs and taking care of your dog's teeth if you, if you want to brush them or, or what's good to chew on. The important thing to know about that is um, the veterinary dentists say that you should not give your dogs anything to chew on that's hard. And if it's hard enough that when you bang your kneecap, it hurts, then it's too hard for the dog. So bones, uh, I used to give my dogs uh, big knuckle bones to chew on. I used to give my dogs bully sticks. They like antlers, they like um, uh, hoofs, cow hoofs. All those things are, are not allowed, well, not allowed, not recommended by the Veterinary Oral Health Council because they can cause fractures in your dog's teeth. And when Ivy, she, the Ivy, the dog that just had all that dental work, she had some work done probably four or five years ago um, and she had a fractured tooth. I had 
first of all, no idea it was fractured. And, and second of all, no idea when she did it. But I used to give my dogs hard things to chew on and I don't anymore. And it's a little bit frustrating because you know they like to chew on those things. But you have to weigh risk versus benefit. And if you've never had a dog that broke a tooth or had to have a tooth pulled, then you probably will keep doing it. But if you have spent thousands of dollars on your dog's teeth, then you might be a little less um, willing to give them hard things to chew on. So the Veterinary Oral Health Council, if you want to look up some things that you should not give your dog, as well as things that are okay to give your dog, then you click on that. So my dogs are chewing on rawhide chips right now. And the thing about rawhide chips is it is possible for them to get it caught in their throat and die from rawhide. And, and I've not seen it happen, but I've read about it. Uh, it's possible if they swap, you know, some dogs like just chew the rawhide until they can swallow it, no matter how big a chunk it is. And it's possible to obstruct the intestines, although it should get mostly digested. But if it gets caught in their throat and blocks their airway, they can suffocate from it. So some people say, oh, I'd never give my dog rawhide because they can choke on it. And yes, that's true. And that's why I never give my dogs rawhide and leave them. So I'm here with them. So if I have to run away from the computer to pull the rawhide out of Quinn's throat, you'll know why. But she's doing fine over there with her rawhide. Okay, so dental disease is common in older dogs. It needs to be dealt with. I've, um, you know, a lot of people or even a lot of veterinarians are reluctant to do a dental cleaning uh, and pull teeth in really old dogs because they're afraid of the anesthesia. And I would argue that there are times when the risk of the anesthesia is less than the risk of not treating the dental disease. So I'd rather have you, you know, keep your dog's teeth relatively healthy, uh, either by taking care of them at home or having regular dental um, exams and treatments when they're relatively young, then wait till they're 16 and their teeth are pretty much fallen out of their mouth. And now you have to anesthetize a 16 year old dog. And again, getting back to what I said at the beginning, old age is not a disease. I am not uh, afraid to anesthetize an older dog. I am very careful and I know that it's a little bit more risky, but it's not, I would never tell a client, well, we can't do that because he's too old. Because if your 16 year old dog broke his leg, we would anesthetize him to fix it. So I don't think using that as an excuse for not taking care of the teeth is valid unless there are some other extenuating circumstances. Uh, next on the list, uh, annual lab work. So should you do blood work on your dog once a year? And, you know, in my opinion, yes, I do when my dogs get to be six or seven. Uh, now, I'm lucky I'm a veterinarian, I can get it done uh, for a lot less money than you can get it done. Uh, and I would recommend if you're going to do blood work on a, on a middle age or older dog, you should have uh, a CBC, which is complete blood count, which uh, checks the red cells and white cells. You should have a chemistry panel that looks at the liver and the, and the kidneys and, and other organs. Uh, and you should do a urinalysis also. And, and uh, that was just drilled into me when I was a resident. If you're gonna do a CBC and a chemistry panel to evaluate a dog that's sick, do a urinalysis at, at your analysis at the same time because you can get a lot more information if you add the urinalysis. So I would submit that you should do a CBC chem panel and urinalysis once a year at least in an older dog and age, you know, older depends on breed. So in a smaller breed, like with the beagles, I would say seven or eight is older. And if you have a great Dane, then I'd say five or six is older. Um, and I also think it, you know, an annual exam is important and not just for vaccines. A lot of the vaccines we give now are uh, given every three years. So you might say, well, my dog's fine. I don't need to see a veterinarian, but I would rather pick up something early on physical exam or uh, with blood work uh, and, and deal with it early than wait for it to get really bad. So I would say yes to annual blood work. I know some people, uh, even have have an ultrasound exam done on their dogs 
abdominal ultrasound, if they have like a breed like a golden retriever that's very prone to cancer, including hemangiosarcoma, to try to catch it early, I don't think that's real common, but I also don't think that's unreasonable. So there are things that you can do with your older dogs to try to catch problems early and treat them early because a lot of diseases can be treated in early stages. You might not be able to slow down the progression, but you certainly, I mean, you might be able to slow down the progression if you can't cure it, but you could slow down the progression, which me, leads me to the next topic, um, which is kidney disease, which again is very common in older dogs. And if you catch it early, then there are things that you can do that will slow down the progression. Uh, and, and early signs of kidney disease are drinking a lot of water and peeing a lot. And again, those are things that people might say, well, she's getting old, but that is, you know, they don't start drinking a lot of water and peeing a lot just because they're getting old. And there's um, other things that can cause PUPD, polyuria polydipsia, which is basically peeing a lot and drinking a lot, uh, like diabetes. But the most common, I think, in older dogs, it's kidney disease. Most of the time it can't be cured, but it certainly can be treated. And that would show up on a chemistry panel and a urinalysis. And so you might have very early signs of kidney disease on the blood work, but your dog is not showing any clinical signs. Uh, so uh, that's something to keep in mind. And then the last thing on my list is heart disease. Heart murmurs are pretty common in older dogs and heart murmurs can be caused by a lot of things, but in older dogs, the most common cause of a heart murmur is, is what we call mitral valve insufficiency. And that's pretty much all I know about heart disease because I don't treat it anymore. I know I can listen to a dog with my stethoscope and, and pick up the heart murmur, but that's all I could do is say, okay, you need to go see a cardiologist. And heart disease is another disease that cannot be cured if it's, if it's you know, if it's in an old dog. If, if a young dog has a congenital heart defect and has a murmur from that, then yes, some of them can be treated. But if your dog is developing valvular insufficiency, that can't be treated, but the subsequent congestive heart failure certainly can be treated to slow down the progression. And I know there are newer drugs now that weren't available when I was in private practice that certainly can slow down the progression of the heart disease. And that's another reason to have an annual exam is your veterinarian will listen to your dog's heart and hopefully pick up a heart murmur early uh, so you can deal with that. And there's lots of good diagnostics. There's, you know, the thoracic ultrasound that can do a really good job of evaluating the heart and, and pinpointing the cause and, and monitoring the progress. So things have progressed a lot since I graduated 40 years ago, uh, but you can't do anything if you don't know it's a problem. Early signs of heart disease are coughing, decreased exercise tolerance, um, coughing, especially at night, restlessness at night. And we've discussed these clinical signs as uh, possibly caused by canine cognitive dysfunction, but heart disease can also cause some of these signs. And again, I don't want you to say, well, she's getting old. Uh, I want you to see your vet and evaluate your, your dog for all these possible causes of the clinical signs that you are seeing. So that's all I have, and I am happy to answer any questions. I see something in the chat. Um, so a question, can marprofen start to cause diarrhea after a long period of time when it did not cause diarrhea? So carprofen is an NSAID. NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And one of the side effects of NSAIDs is gastrointestinal irritation, including vomiting and diarrhea. And the answer is yes, an NSAID can cause diarrhea even if they have been on it for a long time. So what I would recommend is stopping the carprofen and seeing if the diarrhea resolves and then starting it again to see if the diarrhea comes back. Um, the other thing that you can try is stopping the carprofen and trying a different NSAID. And there's four or five NSAIDs that we use commonly 
in dogs. Uh, and sometimes the dog will react to an NSAID, one NSAID, and be fine on another NSAID. The other thing you should know about NSAIDs is there's uh, a new one called Galaprant, and the, the way it works is a little bit different from the others, and it's less likely to have side effects of uh, vomiting diarrhea, it's less likely to affect the kidneys and the liver, and it's sometimes used by veterinarians for older dogs that are having uh, side effects from the, the previous generation of NSAIDs. So whoever asked that, Wendy, um, have you heard of Galaprant? If not, um, you can ask your vet about that if you have an older dog. But what I would do, if, if you were my client, I'd say stop the carprofen, see if the diarrhea goes away, and then let's try it again. But I would also say if your dog is taking carprofen for chronic pain, then I would want another pain medication on board to treat the pain while we stop the NSAID. So if that answers your question, great. If not, uh, ask another question. Can you discuss what supplements are a must have? There are so many out there. Can you overdose on them? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you my opinion. I'll tell you what supplements my dogs are on. My dogs are on uh, a glucosamine chondroitin supplement. Uh, I use Dasequin by Nutramax. It has glucosamine chondroitin and MSM. My dogs do not, to my knowledge, have arthritis yet. Um, there is very little strong scientific evidence that uh, glucosamine chondroitin joint supplements actually help. There is some evidence in people that helps clinical signs, but not much better than a placebo. So some people swear by glucosamine chondroitin joint supplements, and some people say they don't do anything. Uh, there is, and I have to look up this paper, there was one paper that had a tiny bit of evidence that uh, a joint supplement might help prevent joint damage in a dog that's very active. And so my philosophy of, about joint supplements is they may not help, but they're very unlikely to hurt. And so I give it to my dogs because my dogs are very active and it might help and I can afford it. So I, the thing to be aware about supplements as in human supplements, you have to get a reputable brand because a lot of supplements, what they say is in it, it that's really not what's in it. And so um, the company Nutramax they do have good documentation that what they say is in it is really in it. So I use a joint supplement for my dogs. I start them when they're around a year of age. I use um, a supplement called Wellactin, which is an omega-3 uh, fatty acid supplement. Again, there is good evidence that uh, fatty acids are anti-inflammatory, and we know that a lot of chronic diseases are due to inflammation. Uh, it's also supposed to help their coat, although I've never had a problem with my dog's coats. So they get a fatty acid supplement. And those are the two things I give my dogs. Uh, as I said before, there are supplements uh, to help treat canine cognitive dysfunction. So if my dogs were showing signs of that, I'd probably give them some other supplements that are good for that. There's a lot of other supplements that people give Oh, you know what else I give my dogs? I give them kelp. And I started this about six months ago because there was something on the, the Fenzi um, alumni Facebook page about kelp, help, kelp helping keep their teeth clean. And so I started giving them kelp, just a tiny bit of, of powdered kelp. And I think subjectively, yes, I think it does help their teeth a little bit. Uh, but again, there's no scientific evidence that it does or does not help. So if you have a question, so those are the supplements that I use. If you have a specific question about what you use, go ahead and put it in the chat box. Uh, can you overdose on a supplement? It depends what the supplement is. With kelp, yes. I mean, kelp has a lot of iodine, so you potentially can cause thyroid uh, damage, or not damage, but thyroid dysfunction if you give too much kelp. It would be really hard to overdose on a joint supplement. I'd have to look that up. I think that would be really hard to overdose on. 
I think if you gave them way too much fatty acid supplement, you'd probably get diarrhea, but I'm not sure it would hurt them many other ways. So I'll look at that. I see a question here. Does adding a kelp supplement help with dental health? Um, they're actually, when I started giving my dogs kelp, I did read some, some papers that there is evidence that it does help. So hang on a second, let me get my bag. This is, I don't know if you can read it. This is Star West Botanicals Kelp Powder Organic. I got it at Amazon and I give my beagles a 16th of a teaspoon. And I actually ordered tiny little uh, measuring spoons on Amazon. So if your dog has um, a thyroid problem, you would not wanna start kelp without talking to your vet. Um, but I started it, like I said, I started giving this to my dogs about six months ago and, and just subjectively, they might, their teeth might be a little bit cleaner. So that's a kelp question. Okay, can you please speak some cotton in older dogs? I have a 16 year old Cocker Bichon who is needing to be taken out every two to three hours. We just purchased diapers for her at night. We have been working closely with our vet and they are considering Cushing's disease. Okay, that's a good question. Um, but I, you ha there's two things, there a couple of things actually. First of all, incontinence is different from polyuria. Polyuria means that they have to pee often. And there are uh, several different causes for that. Some of the more common ones are uh, kidney disease, Cushing's disease, which is, uh, uh, increase in adrenal hormone production. And um, I forgot, oh, and diabetes. So dogs that have those diseases usually drink more water than normal and they have to pee more than normal, but they can hold their pee. And so they can, um, you know, beg you to take them out every two or three hours, but they don't just leak urine. Oh, and another common reason of them having to pee very often is a bladder infection. So that's something that uh, you would need to have your vet check out. Incontinence means that they are leaking urine. And it, incontinence in older female dogs is usually related to them being spayed, um, especially spayed early. But not all spayed dogs have incontinence and not all dogs that have incontinence are incontinent because of uh, being spayed. So if your dog is leaking urine, and it's most common for them to leak urine when they're sleeping, so they'll, they'll wake up and there's a wet spot in the bed where they were sleeping, in your bed or their bed, wherever they sleep, then that's different and it has to be treated differently. So if you have to take your dog out every two or three hours, then yes, you need to have your dog worked up for Cushing's disease, for renal disease, for diabetes, for a bladder infection and treat whatever is causing the polyuria. If your dog is leaking urine and does, I mean, they don't even know that they're dripping urine, then that's different. And, and that has to be evaluated also. And in an older dog um, with any type of urinary problems, we also have to think of cancer of the urinary bladder because if, if they have a big old tumor growing in their bladder, there's not a lot of room for, um, for them to hold urine so they have to pee more often. Although in my experience, we, um, we diagnose uh, tumors in the bladder because the dog has to pee more frequently because the tumor irritates the bladder and not because the tumor takes up so much space that um, they just don't have any room to hold the urine. Um, okay, continents, and we talked about kelp. Okay, thank you. You'll check on the galloprant. Okay, adequan. So adequan is um, a, a injectable. It's an adequan is not really a supplement. Adequan is a. It's it consists of polysulfated glycosaminoglycans, which is just a long name for the components of cartilage in the joint. It's given by an injection, um, usually under the skin or in the muscle. And in some dogs, adequan 
really helps with signs of arthritis. It has to, usually is given twice, um, twice a week for three or four weeks, and then as needed, you know, usually once every three or four weeks. And in some dogs, it works really well to control their clinical signs of arthritis. In other dogs, it doesn't do much good. So it won't rebuild the cartilage. It, it will help with some of the inflammation from the um, arthritis, and it, and it might help improve the quality of the cartilage. So Adequan is not a supplement. It, it usually is not given unless we're treating arthritis. Nancy, you gave Keo Adequan, right? Do you think it helped? Yeah, I did, and I just posted to the group. It did nothing for her. Okay. It did nothing for her. I did also just um, send you a private message. Uh, my dog has been diagnosed with moderate arthritis in several joints, and I'm working closely with the vet up at Cornell, Chris Fry, who uh, who Sue referred me to, um, and. Dr. Fry said that in addition to using Dasaquin, he strongly recommends the use of green lipped muscle. And I think that has made a difference for her. Yeah. And he also said that the omega-3 oils are crucial and are solid anti-inflammatories, but it takes up to six months or more for them to actually get insufficient amounts enough in the tissue for them to make a difference. Just FYI. Yeah. The other thing about the uh, omega-3 fatty acids is um, from talks that I've gone to, um, we should be giving our dogs about twice the amount that is recommended on the labels. Yeah. And, and I, I would yeah. have to calculate a dosage for each dog. Um, but yeah, so um, um, green lip muscle is a component of a lot of joint supplements. It's not in... Um, Dazequin, but it is on, in a lot. And if my dogs had arthritis and they were not doing well on Dazequin, I'd probably add other supplements because there's a lot of different joint supplements that from what I've read are pretty good. And I don't have the list with me now. I have my list at home, but, but there are some good ones. Yeah, my experience, because I'm, I'm sort of a self-made expert on canine arthritis at this point. I'm a moderator for a Facebook group on canine arthritis. So I'll see you there if you want to join the group. Um, yeah. Somebody mentioned turmeric. Turmeric can help with anti-inflammatory properties. Bone broth is good and the dogs love it. So if you have old bones, don't throw them out. Just boil them up for 24 to 48 hours with a little bit of uh, apple cider and let them have the broth. I bet they like that. Oh boy. And, they Botswaler also is, is a yes. anti-inflammatory and Botswaler is in a lot of joint supplements. So there are a lot of things that you can try. Like I said, I gave a, a webinar on treatment of chronic pain. I think I had like 35 or 40 different things that you could do to try to treat your dog's chronic pain. So no dog should be in pain. Um, I mean, it shouldn't be, well, the NSAIDs don't help. So there's nothing I can do. There's lots that you can do. Um, it's very you, individualized for the dog too. Yeah. So. Can you spell the fatty acid supplement? It's called, I'll get it for you. Hang on. I use Nordic Naturals. You can either use what Sue uses or Nordic Naturals it has a great pet yep. version I have. of omega-3s, which we give to our pups. It's called Wellactin, W-E-L-A-C-T-I-N. Um, but yeah, Nordic Naturals is good, uh, and, and there are probably other good ones. Uh, uh, again, Nutramax makes well actin, and I know that they are a good company, and they do a lot of research. Um, I think New Nordic Naturals is also a good company. The and when that, I Sorry, Sue. The two that Chris Fry, the, vet, the rehab vet at Cornell, mentioned by name were well actin and Nordic Naturals, so either of those are fine. Yep, yep. Um, Tolerance of MSM can be limited and cause GI upset. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, got the fatty acid supplement, Dr. Fry. Chews made out of bamboo, safe for chewing. If you can bang your knee with it and it doesn't hurt, then yes, it's safe for chewing, but you need to go to the Veterinary Oral Health Council website and look it up because I'm not familiar with bamboo, but it, I would think that bamboo would be okay because it's not very hard naturally. 
Uh, somebody says the excess of Atacon is very individual. Absolutely agree 100%. Okay, my 15 and a half year old Beagle who is on seizure meds and takes several other supplements and Purina, Purina Bright Mind has been waking up in the middle of the night. I take him out to potty and then he has a really hard time getting settled again. So at least one of us is not getting much sleep. Yep. Uh, anything else I can do to help him sleep through the night? Uh, he's on Bright Mind. So in the hand is in the handout. I talk about uh, selectoline, which is anapril, um, which is a treatment for canine cognitive dysfunction. Uh, there's a supplement called Senolife, uh, which contains antioxidants, and another supplement called Sammy. And so um, those. And again, I don't treat canine cognitive dysfunction because I do sports medicine and I do surgery. Uh, so I'm just telling you what I've read and what I've learned from uh, attending seminars. I don't actually treat dogs that have it. Uh, I would certainly rule out anything else that could be causing pain, uh, but it does sound like um, canine cognitive dysfunction. So he might need more than just a purine of right mind. So that's what I would uh, talk to your vet about some of these other supplements. Um, for what it's worth, I have had amazing results with Adequan with several sports dogs. So there you go. I mean, it's just like we said, it's very individual. And I too have had very good results treating dogs with Adequan and other dogs, they don't react at all. But again, Adequan is, is like a lot of these other supplements. Um, it can take several weeks to, sh to see results. So you can't treat them for a week and go, oh, it's not helping. Uh, and also some of these supplements for canine cognitive dysfunction. Um, oh, let's see, I thought I had written down in my notes how long it can take, um, but I don't. But uh, I, also, um, I have notes, well, I can't see that. So I have notes from a lecture I went to and they talk about other treatment for uh, canine cognitive dysfunction. And again, you're not going to cure the disease. You might slow down the progress. Uh, some of the things they mention are exercise. So uh, if you should keep exercising your older dogs and if they have arthritis, then you have to treat the arthritis and you have to make them not fat so they can exercise. Learning new things. So teaching them stupid pet tricks. Uh, I have written down here, rich social life and enrichment. So maybe give them um, food toys instead of just putting their food in a bowl, put their food in a toy where it takes them a while to, to get it out. Um, maybe interacting with other dogs if they're good with other dogs. And then addressing any other underlying problems like ortho or dental pain. Um, endocrine problems like Cushing's disease or diabetes. Uh, sometimes medications that you're giving can cause some of these other things. And Mary, I'm not familiar with, I assume you asked this question, uh, unless somebody else has a beagle. Um, you know, I'm not sure what seizure meds you're on. I would look up the side effects of seizure medications, because that could be a side effect of the medication. You might have to adjust the dose or try different medications. So, and then the diet, um, anapril um, supplements. And there are other drugs that you can use to treat anxiety. And then there's a, a drug that's really commonly used now. It's called trazodone, which is a very mild uh, sedative, which it, it has very few side effects. It just kind of takes the edge off. And so that might be something you could try and that might just take the edge off enough so that when you take him out to potty, um, he can settle back in again. So trazodone, T-R-A-Z-A-D-O-N-E uh, might be a good uh, drug to try or something you could ask your vet about because your vet might not think of it. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. Good results with Adequan, Botswaler. Yeah, any thoughts on Botswaler? My only thought about Botswaler is, is lectures that I've listened to about treatment of arthritis recommend Botswaler as a possible treatment because of its anti-inflammatory properties. So go for it. And there are some um, 
uh, supplements that have uh, glucosamine conjointin supplements that have Botswala in it. In fact, I think Dazequin, I use Dazequin Advanced. Hang on, don't go away. I don't get kicked back from Nutramax, but I should. Um, oh, it doesn't say on the label. Uh, some Dazequin products have, have Botswala, I think. So they make different uh, types. Our rehab that started my older girl on collagen last year. Um, is it oral collagen? Is that a, an oral supplement? <laughs> Sorry, my dog's under the sheet that's covering the couch and she can't get out. Don't, hang on a sec before she falls off. Come here, you. This is Quinn. Mary bred this dog. She's a sweetie, but she gets into trouble. Says, Hi, Grandma Mary. Okay, she's going away. But she was under the sheet and she was going to fall off the, the back of the couch because she couldn't see. Okay. Um, our rehab that, oh, oh, collagen. Um, write, type in what you're, how you're using it and what you're using it for. What do you recommend for pain control? CBD oil. Okay, again, I did a webinar and, and I was talking about treatment of chronic pain and, and I went through 30 or 35 different things you can do, drugs, supplements, nutraceuticals, uh, acupuncture, all types of other modalities. So for pain, it depends what's causing the pain. It depends on whether it's chronic. CBD oil, there is some evidence that CBD does help with pain. There was a study done at Cornell. Uh, I was actually the, um, the manufacturer of the CBD that they used. I went to a talk that they gave and they just talked about how great the results were. And when I actually read the paper, I was underwhelmed at the results that they got. They, they got some improvement in the pain. So I think CBD is like any other supplement. Some dogs, it's gonna make a big difference. And in some dogs, it's not going to help at all. So I think CBD is worth a try. Just as, a, just as an interjection here, I am going to be organizing a talk by a veterinarian, Dr. Kyra Marsigliano, who has just gotten a master's degree in pharmacology, and she specialized, her focus was on CBD oil. So I'm going to organize that for GBKC too. Just stay tuned. Well, let me know, Nancy, so I can attend also. Absolutely. Um, so what I would recommend for pain is very individualized, depends on the dog, it depends on what's causing the pain. I tend to go with a, what we call a multimodal approach. So I tend to use more than one thing if I need to. Uh, and in fact, uh, I often use, when I would see dogs in my sports medicine practice, I would often often see dogs that have been in pain for, for weeks to, to months. And so I would usually start them or two, on two or three different pain meds, as well as some supplements, and then kind of take the pain meds away one at a time uh, once they start responding. Some veterinarians would start with one, then add another, then add a third. And, and it's, you know, it's neither right or wrong how you do it. I, that's just how I chose to do it. Um, so if you want to be a little more specific uh, about pain control, type it in a box, but it really depends on what you're treating and for how long you have to treat them and how bad the pain is. With activity with an arthritic dog, how much and what kind? So uh, again, it depends on, on where the arthritis is and how bad it is. Um, walking is really good exercise. If they are so painful that they, it's just really hard for them to walk until you can get the pain under control with meds, uh, there's something called an underwater treadmill. And Nancy uses that for Keo for just fitness. Uh, but by having the dog walk in water, it takes a lot of the pressure off the joints and they can move easier than they can on land. And she loves it. The dog's yeah. 
dogs really like it because it's it's fun. It's like a spa day for them. And they get treats as they walk. Yeah, right. and, and even dogs that um, are afraid of water seem to do well in the treadmill. You can, you can start the water out at a very low level and gradually increase it. So, you know, very few dogs do not manage to adapt to the underwater treadmill. So I think walking, just like with people, is a good exercise. Swimming is good exercise because there's no weight on the joints. Um, and if they're comfortable, let them run. Uh, the thing is, the exercise shouldn't be forced. So you should, if you normally take your dog jogging and now they have a lot of arthritis, you might not be able to jog as often or as fast or as far but they can still run a little if they're comfortable doing it. So I usually tell my clients, once the dog's pain is under control, let them do what they can do. And then they'll tell you if they can't do it. So if you're taking them for a two mile walk and about halfway out, they say, uh, I'm done, it hurts. Then don't take them for a two mile walk, take them for a one mile walk and see how they do with that. So again, it's, it's not a one size fit fits all and it's very individualized and that's why I have to you know evaluate each dog get a good history and just tailor the treatment regimen to that individual dog um, what do you think about mushroom supplements as an anti-cancer regimen huh I don't know anything about it so sorry do you have any suggestions when it comes to older dogs being confused when they first wake up? You have a 13 year old Corgi who tends to be very confused and quite confrontational when woken up, um, either in the morning or when it come, uh, when one of us comes home um, from work. Uh, yeah, my first thought would be canine cognitive dysfunction. And I would look at, uh, I mean, first of all, talk to your vet get a thorough exam, a CBC chem panel urinalysis, and then consider uh, canine cognitive, dysf cognitive dysfunction and either the diet or the drugs or the supplements that treat that. Where can we find the handout, Nancy? Yeah, I, it's posted with the GBKC Facebook um, invitation or event listing. And I will make sure that that is posted with this recording. So please be patient. Okay, so the, uh, I asked about collagen. It's collagen protein in a powder form from Dr. Apps, uh, used for arthritis. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to write it down to look it up because I don't know anything about it. Um, but I would think it probably works the same way as any other joint supplement. It helps with cartilage health, maybe. Um, and I don't think collagen has any anti-inflammatory properties, but... I'm going to load it up, but I, I don't know. I can't help you. Is there anything topical for pain? There is in people. Um, you can get um, an, an NSAID uh, ointment. You can also get a local anesthetic ointment or cream. The problem with dogs is that for it to really have any hope of working, you would have to clip their fur. And so I'm not sure it's very um, practical for animals. There are patches. There's something called a fentanyl patch. Uh, it's, it's a patch that, that contains a, a narcotic called fentanyl, which um, is slowly released through the skin. You have to clip it, you clip the dog's fur to put it on, and you have to put it on a spot like in the middle of their back where they can't scratch it off or chew it off and eat it because that would probably cause an overdose. Uh, but other than that, I don't think it's, it's anything that's real practical for animals. Okay, Nancy put in a note about the handout. Um, Christine says she's accessed it through the Facebook page and is not seeing it, so it's not up yet. Okay. It is up. It's just it's hard to find that specific event page. Well, make it easier, Nancy. It's Facebook. <laughs> hey, I like that. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know anything. I know nothing. Um, is there an event page for the webinar? Yes, there was an event page for the webinar, but I okay. can't get to it because I'm hosting. Okay. Did you say your dogs are on Daisyquin Advanced? Yes. 
Daisy Quinn advanced. Does that show up backwards to you guys? It shows no. up backwards. Okay. Daisy Quinn advanced. And Will Acton. Will Acton. Star West Botanicals. You know, when I pack up to leave for the winter, I have more stuff for the dogs than I have for me, but they're worth it. Okay. So I have no, anybody else have any more questions? That's all I've got in the chat box. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Um, it's nice to see other people, even if it is virtual. And um, if you have any questions, ask Nancy and she can ask me and I can. We'll get you the them. info. Yep. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you so much, Sue. We really appreciate your time. Enjoy no the rest problem. of your time in North Carolina. See you I'm soon. Sure I will. The sunshine and the yeah. sand and the sea. Sea and snow land. Yeah. No snow. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. And